Hey everybody, Pastor Jared here. Have you ever wanted to give a Christmas gift to yourself? Come on now, we all have. And I have the perfect gift for you to give yourself this Christmas Eve. We're having our Grace Community Church Christmas Eve services at Sugarloaf Performing Arts Center. Google it, you'll find it. It's out there near Warwick. Doing two services on Christmas Eve Eve, and then we're doing three services on Christmas Eve. Come on out, and by the way, this gift you give yourself, you can give to others as well. So invite your family, invite your friends, even if it's a drive, come on out. It'll be worth it because as Grace Community Church, it's a gift we want to give to you. See you then. All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Grace. Glad you are here and glad we're in this season preparing for Christmas. I love this time. I love the season of preparation for Christmas. And if you've been following Grace on Facebook, you've been seeing the different pastors. We've been sharing some devotionals, kind of leading us up in this time, preparing for this, uh, this event of Christmas and celebrating what God has done for us. I just want to celebrate personally here at this campus what you're doing what God has done through you. And I don't know if you know this, but the people sitting next to you are very generous people. And we have challenged us as a community here in Washingtonville to respond to the needs of the people right around us. And you guys have risen to the challenge. Right around Thanksgiving time, we said, hey, there are needy families here in Washingtonville, in our community. The schools reach out to us and say, can you help us meet the need of these families for Thanksgiving? And you guys rose to the challenge and you fulfilled 76 Thanksgiving baskets, full meals. You guys did that. That's because of your generosity. And then the elementary schools, they reach back out to us again and they say, hey, can you help us make Christmas happen for needy families in the schools uh, that, that we know these families really, really desperately need help? And boy, there's a ton of people that need help right now. And this, so the request was the largest we've ever received from the elementary schools. And quite honestly, as I saw that number, I was anxious, like, God, how are we going to do this? Even a, a church as large as Grace, even a campus as large as Washingtonville, the need was gigantic. So we try to do two gifts for every kid of a family. We also try to give a family gift card to try and make Christmas happen for these needy families, uh, these elementary schools. So 334 gifts were requested this year. Hold on before you applaud, okay? 72 gift cards on top of that that were requested. So that's a total of 406 things we had to buy. And it got down the last week and it was like 20 some gifts left and we cannot not do it. It has to be done. It has to be done. I'm like, okay, God, how are you going to do this? How are you do this? And God always just says, Jim, trust me, trust me. And we get a call from two different individuals say, hey, I know there's a gap. I'll just pay whatever's left to go get those gifts. So you guys did it. 406 things you had it and made it for Christmas happen. And if you want to just be up next to the miracle, you can hang out afterwards at 1.30. They're going to be wrapping all those gifts so that we can get to the, that to the schools tomorrow morning. So well done in preparation for making Christmas happen for a lot of people that are really going to be blessed by that. So there's a lot of stuff I would love to just preach about as your campus pastor, but I get it. It's December 18th and you're expecting, boy, this better be like a Christmas message because we were singing the songs and I'm in the mood, Jim. So let's hear one of those. So, okay, okay, okay. So I'm going to do that, but I want to talk about, well, I'm just, here's, a, here's a heartbeat thing. Man, uh, this is something that has been so on the heart of me, on Jay Cackle, and a lot of men here at our campus. God, would you do something through our men? And it isn't just for men that we're going to speak about, but I'm going to focus on the men. Why? Because I think there's an attack culturally on men. And I think the enemy wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And the, and the big bullseye right now seems to be on men. And I, I want, if you're a man here today, I want to let you know, you're not going to be slammed. You're not going to be discouraged. I hope you're going to walk out of this, this door today with your chest full and you're going to be, God, do something through me. And really, I hope that's for all of us, 
all of us that God would do that. Because I do think there's an attack. I mean, there's this phrase, this is the phrase toxic masculinity, which is such a stupid phrase to me. Like, masculinity isn't ta- toxic in and of itself. Like, there's, there's, if it's toxic, it's just toxic people. Whether you're male or female, there's just nasty, bad people around us. And so I want to focus on all the good things, not just men, men and women, uh, but we're going to look at some scriptures today. What I think of men, and I think of moments in my life that have been impacted by men in the moment they rose to the challenge. Now, they weren't perfect men, uh, but they were men in these moments and had such a profound impact on my life. I think about my own, my own dad. My dad passed away just over a year ago now. And I reflected in that time of grieving over those, those moments. Not a perfect guy, my dad, but wow, these moments. My dad didn't become a Christian until way later in life. Uh, and, and I remember uh, way later, he went on, I think I was in high school at the time, he went on a missions trip to Haiti. And he came back from that missions trip. His life was changed, transformed. God just did something very real and powerful in his life. And so in high school, I remember every single morning, I would come down, get ready for school, and my dad would be on his recliner chair reading. This is his Bible. He'd be reading his Bible. Every single morning, I'd get up, and my dad, sorry, I didn't mean to slam the Bible. Uh, <laughs> he'd, be, he'd be reading his Bible, and that had a, a huge impact on his saw, Oh, this is real to him. I also remember every Thursday morning, Every single Thursday morning at 6 a.m., he was at our church praying with a group of people, for people, for people at our church, for our church, for people around him in our lives. Every single Thursday morning at 6 a.m., even in the midst of blizzards, dad would get up and he would drive to the church and they would pray. By the way, New York, coming from Minnesota, you were just so lame with your blizzards, okay? (laughs) I mean, I was ready, like Thursday, Friday's like snowblowers, ready, I got the gas, let's do this. And like, weak, so weak. Okay, I'm judging, I'm judging, yes, I'm judging. But my dad, those, those moments, I remember a, a, another time, my dad uh, had, had his own business, his partners with another guy, and he ended up selling off his part of his, his half of the business to another guy. And the guy was paying, he's paying, he's paying, Pain, making payments, making payments, and then he stopped making payments and stopped making payments, and you get it, right? What a really hard spot to be in. And I remember, my dad was sitting in just like a service like you are today, and the Lord just, just put it on him, and he said, forgive him. And he did. My dad, tens of thousands of dollars, my dad said, you're forgiven. Now, I don't know what that, it didn't matter what it did for that guy. I just, I saw that in my dad's life and had a profound, those are just moments. My dad wasn't a perfect guy, but there was moments where dad responded to what God would have for him. I think of Naomi's dad, my wife, Naomi's dad, pastor for many, many years, but then he had a stroke and wasn't able to, to preach, wasn't able to do his heart's passion anymore. But Dave has always been a man of just bloom where you're planted. Just, okay, God, this is what you've given me here now. This is what I'm going to be, be faithful to. And today, today, uh, you know, his, his health isn't great. He's on dialysis. That's three times a week, like four hours. But wherever Dave is, he is discipling men. And I would say confidently, there are at least 100 men that would say confidently and boldly would say, my life has been profoundly impacted by Dave Quam discipling me. Now, Dave's not a perfect guy, but there are moments where Dave said, yes, God. That's what I'm looking for all of us today. For moments in front of us, for moments in front of all of us. And you know, as a man I, or, or a woman, I'm not looking over my shoulder going, who's going who's to deal with this? It's me. When I look at what's hurting in my community, I'm not going to look around. It's me. When I'm looking at what needs to happen here, even at this church, I'm not looking around. It's me. And when I think about the moments in front of me, here's the, here's the big one. Here's the one in, in, right in front of my windshield. It's my family. It's my family. Yeah, my family. <laughs> Right, all right, my son, my oldest son just got married. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so beautiful and just so great to just get him going. <laughs> no, it was a beautiful event right before Thanksgiving. We're so excited. But I weigh heavy when it gets really close to me. 
the moments in front. And I'm not looking to my left or to my right. I'm looking at in the mirror, God, what do you have for me? Now that might sound scary to you and overwhelming. But here's a passage we've been reflecting a lot as men here at the campus, Ecclesiastes 4.10. But pity anyone who falls or fails and has no one there to help them up. As a man, that is the scariest verse I can think of, that when I come to the end of my life, that the definition of my life will be failure and alone. Failure and alone. That is a terrifying thought to me. So if that's terrifying to you, let me encourage you. Around you are a lot of imperfect people. That is the story of grace that God is working on all of us. they realizing, we're all realizing, we need to own the moments around us. And we, we, have, we need others to help us accomplish this. So let me give the whole passage, Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 10. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one there to help them up. So just specific to men, men, if you're seeming overwhelmed, if today you're like, God, what do I do? If you're just feeling imperfect or you're seeing those moments, those key moments coming in front of you, in front of your family, in front of your community, let me encourage you. We got some groups kicking off in January. Man up groups starting in January. It's only five weeks. It's only, you're only talking five weeks. Guys, let me encourage you to not be in a spot in your life where it's gonna be failure and alone. You have guys around you here that wanna rally around you and encourage you for the moments ahead. So sign up, graceoc.com slash groups. But it's not just who men, again, who need to own the moments in our life. We all do, whether we're young or old, whether you're a teenager, there are moments in front of you, or whether you're old, whether you're male or female, there are moments in front of all of us. So we're gonna look at the scriptures today to find truth, to revive our soul. So let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. It's living and it's active and it's powerful to transform our lives. So Father, today as we look into your word, your scriptures, your living word, we pray you refine us. We have the courage to respond in Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to look at some of the men in the story around Christmas. Some of the men in the story around Christmas. So let's talk quickly about Joseph. Joseph, married to Mary, father, step, stepfather, you get what I mean, uh, of Jesus, Joseph. So Matthew 1, Matthew chapter 1. You got your Bibles in, in the seatbacks in front of you. Go and pull that out or on your phone. Or some of you clearly have it memorized. So you don't need to look it up. I'm looking around the room, Okay. Way to go. All right. Got it memorized. Pastor Jim, I got that memorized. Matthew 1, verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, so they're not yet married. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was, a faithful, was faithful to the law, he did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had it in mind to divorce her quietly. Now, Joseph is right in thinking, what? I am clearly not the father of this child. I have not been with Mary. So someone else must be the father. So he is doing what is right under the law. He is trying to actually protect Mary by the divorce quietly. Because if it's exposed publicly, there's shame and actually physical judgment that could happen to Mary. So he's trying to do the right thing. But then something happens, verse 20. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him. Whoa. In a dream. Whenever there's a moment in front of you and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Don't be afraid. Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you're to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said to the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now look at Joseph's response, verse 24. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. There was a moment, just a moment, 
Joseph's not a perfect guy. We don't know all about Joseph, but we know Joseph is a man. And so he's got sin in his life. He's imperfect. But Joseph had a moment in front of him. And he could have said, not my problem. I didn't make this mess. This is somebody else's problem. I'm just going to walk away. That would seem like a righteous good thing. But God intervened and said, Joseph, will you surrender to what I have for you? Will you just surrender to what I have for you? And Joseph said, yes. Joseph said, yes. And we all know the rest of the story. And we know it because Joseph said, yes. A moment in front of it, just a small moment in trusting what God had before him. Let's talk about the shepherds. These guys, I love these guys. What are they, what are they doing? Well, we're in Luke chapter two. Luke chapter two in your Bibles or on your phones. Clearly a lot of memorizers all around me. Very impressed. Wow, love you guys. I'm just being sarcastic, but seriously, look in your Bible. Luke chapter two. I say that, by the way, because I never want you to take my word for it. Don't trust me. Seriously, don't trust me. Trust the word. Okay, Matthew chapter 2. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. Now, why were they there? Why were they there? Because they liked camping. No, no one likes camping. It's not a thing. It's not a thing. No, there are some people that say they like camping, and I judge them for that. (laughs) I don't get it. I don't get it. They're there because this is their job. This is their livelihood because people are counting on them, family, people in their community. People are counting on these guys to deliver, and they're not looking over their shoulder to their left or their right. They're doing what they need to do. They're there because their sheep have predators, Their sheep have predators that want to kill and destroy the sheep. And if the sheep gets stolen or or killed or or whatever happens to sheep, it's on them. And it's on their family, the consequences of that. So they are there right next to what's most important for them. To see that no predators attack them. To see that no thieves steal from them. And to see that no sheep wander off. That's why they're there even at night to protect the sheep. It's their job. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. Whoa. And the glory of the Lord showed around them. And they got out their phones and videoed it. (laughs) Whoa. I mean, Instagram would be lit up, right? No, it says they were terrified. And we would be too. If God showed up, his holy presence today in this room, we'd have the same response we would be terrified because of the greatness of who God is. Because of the greatness of who God is. They were terrified. But the angel said to them, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior is born to you, and he's the Messiah. And this will be assigned to you. You're going to find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heavens. And on earth, peace to those whom whom his favor rests. Verse 15, when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, well, we've got these sheep. I'm sure it was going to be a big deal, but we've got to take care of the sheep. No. Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told about this child. And all who had heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. Now, get what happens here. What were they doing prior to the angel? They were watching their sheep at night. Why were they out there? To make sure nothing happens to the sheep. What did they do after the angel told them what was going to happen? They left the sheep. Do you get the the risk of that? Do you get, if something happens to these sheep, we might lose everything. But they said, this moment 
is far greater than all these things. We cannot miss this moment. So we're going to trust God. We're going to not be afraid. And this moment, we're going to make sure we're there for it. Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God, because in that moment, and for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Encouraging. But they're just moments. The shepherds are not perfect guys. Joseph is not a perfect guy. They're just moments. In those moments, what did they do? They surrendered to what God had for them. Let's look at another guy, Herod. Herod really is quite the antithesis of all these other guys. Uh, Now, if you do your history, you know, these aren't just stories, by the way. These are people of history, people of history. And Herod is certainly one of those well-known people of history. Herod is king over this part of Israel. And he doesn't start off as king. First, he's a procreator, then he's a tetrarch, and then eventually crowned as king, but not crowned by the Jews. He's crowned king of the Jews, by the Romans. The Romans who are in control, who are oppressing the Jews, says, here's what we want. We want a Jewish appearing king to be king over. So we're not looking so bad. We're going to put this puppet king, which we're really pulling the strings on. We're going to call him the king. And Herod rose to the occasion in all the wrong ways. Herod was in completely uh, immoral. He was, he was just a terrible, terrible per- person. Killed a wife, killed several of his children. Uh, eventually, uh, right five days before he's going to die, he sees one of his sons might be the next king. So he kills that son. Just a horrible, horrible guy. Herod's known for a lot of buildings, great buildings that you can still go see today in Israel. The way you got those buildings, though, was how are you going to pay for those? The Romans come in and they put oppressive taxes on the people oppressive. You think you got it bad in New York, and man, do we got it bad in New York, right? Imagine what's going on in Rome, and you've got no recourse. you got no plea. It's the Romans. Well, Herod says, yeah, but I want a little bit more, and guess what? You can't do anything about it. So the Roman level, then Herod takes it up a notch, and then we know the tax collectors themselves, they want an extra, so the tax collectors take a little bit more. So your, your tax bill comes due, and it's the Roman Herod tax collector due. That's what, you, that's what you owe. So Herod is known for oppressing the people. What do we see in him in Matthew chapter 2 in your Bibles or on your phones? You getting this by now? Okay, Matthew 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi wise men from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who had been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Now, when Herod heard this, he's like, praise God, the Messiah has come, king of the Jews. No way, that's not what he says. When king heard heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chiefs, priests, and teachers of the law, He asked them, where was the Messiah to be born? Now, he asked, where was the Messiah to be born? Because he doesn't read his Bible. He doesn't know the word. Everybody knows the Messiah is going to be born. What do they say? In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people. Now, those were not encouraging words to Herod. Those were the most disturbing to a power-hungry, self-seeking, self-glorifying person. Those are the most disturbing words he could have heard. So what does this shrewd, uh, wicked king do? Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go search carefully for this child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I can go worship him too. Nope. That's not why he wants to know where the, bi- the, the baby's going to be born. So this king who has been established by the Romans, by Mark Anthony and by Caesar Augustus, says, I want to know where this threat to my kingdom is. Now, ro- a little bit more about Herod, so you, you get the distinction. Herod, a lot of buildings around ancient Israel today that you can still go see today. You can see part of the temple that Herod reconstructed. The temple, which is the main focal point in Jerusalem, in Israel. 
in just the landscape alone, if you go to Jerusalem, you get like the, the amount of space that the temple would take up rivals even what we see like Central Park. That was one of the things most astonishing when Neil and I came here and we saw New York City for the first time. We said, man, Central Park takes up a lot of a really prime real estate temple, so much so, elevated on the plateau so everybody can see it. Now, why does Herod rebuild the temple? Well, probably to appease the Jews who hate him. That's a good political strategy. But some also argue so that he can get access to the genealogies so he knows exactly who are in the line of David so he can take care of it. See the wickedness? Also, what is all this he built? He built something called Masada. If you go to Israel today, you can see the uh, archaeology find of Masada. This is in the Dead Sea. This is one of the escapes that Herod has. If it just all goes bad, everything goes south for Herod, he can escape to the Dead Sea to this impenetrable fortress. You get like, you cannot access, access this, right, as an army. There's a path we actually hiked up. I was there like 30 years ago, and you can go visit Masada today. What of what, uh, what, Herod built. I think there's another picture we have it a little bit more beautiful. <gasps> beautiful, beautiful. But that was a monument that was for Herod. That was not for the people. That was not for anybody else. That was for Herod to make sure Herod was safe at the great expense of the Jewish people. Also, he built this nice retreat area for himself just outside of Bethlehem called Herodium. It's one of the most important, unique building complexes built by Herod during the first century. It was considered the most important buildings of the ancient world. The site, which is intended to commemorate Herod, uh, was planned as a massive complex of palaces, and at that time was the largest in the Roman world, incorporating an imposing palace fortress on the hilltop, an administrative area, and a splendid recreation center at its foot. Doesn't that just sound inviting? Beautiful, beautiful. Just outside of Bethlehem, Herod builds this. Why? For Herod. It is all about Herod, and I'm going to crush anybody that gets in my way. It's a real story. It's not made up. It's in the history books. And then the most notorious thing we know about Herod, that's Matthew 2, 16. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all of the boys in Bethlehem. What a wicked guy. And his vicinity, who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time they had learned from the Magi. So let's, let's just do a little comparison and contrast between these guys. So on the left, we've got Joseph and the shepherds. What kind of guys were they? They were faithful. They trusted God in those moments. They were humble. Not, not my will, God, but your will be done. That's hard, because I got a lot I want to be in charge about. Don't you? They were willing to be humiliated and suffer loss for someone else's sake. They were willing to be humiliated and to suffer great personal loss for someone else's sake. They were men of honor. They did what was right in the moment. They were watchful, observant, discerning, even wise. They understood the greater moment in front of them. They were strong-willed. In other words, they had resolve. They had the courage to follow through what was necessary. They were obedient. Obedience just means at the moment doing the right thing. It's not perfection. At the moment, they did the right thing, and they worked hard. They worked hard. Okay, contrast that with Herod. Herod was fearful, fearful of anybody that would take away anything that was important in his life any usurpers, and he did everything he could to protect himself. He was prideful. Whatever I want, I will get. It doesn't matter what it costs anybody else around me. I know I can be that way. I know I can be prideful. I know I can be fearful and trying to protect myself. Killed his own family. Now that one's okay. <sighs> All right. Uh, and if, okay, uh, we can all kind of own different parts of the story. If we, we love you uh, at Grace, and uh, we're glad you're here. We're glad you're here, but uh, we'll get you some help. Okay. <laughs> he was disgraceful. Instead of doing the right things, he was clueless. He didn't even know where he was going to be born. He was weak. He was disobedient. And he had others do his, his own work, his dirty work. 
Now, here's the hard part for all of us to recognize in this, is that we can see more of ourselves in Herod than we can in Joseph and the shepherds, if we're honest about the moments in front of us. Any one of those words under Herod, we can go, yep, if I'm being honest with myself. And when we're seeing those God-ordained moments in front of us, when you're thinking about your family, you're thinking about your workplace, you're thinking about your community, you're thinking about those moments in front of you, what are you going to do? And that, like I said before, that can be a really scary thought, failure and alone. What are you going to do about those moments in front of you? Let me encourage you. Let me, let me put it really so simple, yet so powerful. It starts with surrender. It starts with saying, I can't do this myself. God, I need you. I can't do this myself. God, I need you. It's not a passive surrender. It's not saying, oh, well, <laughs> I guess somebody else is going to have to do it. It's not that. It's a, God, I can't do this. I need you. I need you. What does that look like? Some, a very familiar passage probably you, many of you have heard before. Psalm 23. What does surrender look like? The 23rd Psalm. It starts this way. The Lord is my shepherd. Now, I would say, if that's a loving passage for you, I would say, you don't get anything else in the rest of the passage until first the Lord is your shepherd. Until you start with surrender, until you bow your knee, until you say, God, I can't do this. I need your help. Until the Lord is your shepherd, nothing else applies. The Lord is my shepherd. And because the Lord is my shepherd, I will lack nothing. Or you might say, I shall not want he makes me lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside quiet waters because he knows what's good for me, what's best for me. Even in, the spite, in spite of me, he knows. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through dark valleys, through storms, through hardship, through tragedies, he walks with me. And I'm gonna fear no evil because he is with me. Where does my courage come from? Not of myself. Not of myself. My courage comes from the Lord, who is my shepherd. And your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, your goodness and your love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What is that passage? It is a passage about moments in front of you. And what are you going to do in those moments? I surrender. I can't do this myself. God, I need you. Now, who is the shepherd? How do I know him? How do I bow my knee to him? Well, we have the answer. In John chapter 10, Jesus says, and it's all about Jesus, whether you're Mary or Joseph or the Magi or the shepherds, it's all about Jesus. They're secondary. The story's not about Mary. It's not about Joseph. It is about Jesus proving God has come to earth for all our rescue for our salvation. It is about Jesus. And so Jesus says in John chapter 10, the thief comes to steal, to kill and destroy. I have come that you would have life. There are moments in front of you and the good shepherd says, I have come that you would have life, life to the full. And Jesus declares this. He says, I am the good shepherd. And I'm going to lay down my life for my sheep. What kind of shepherd do you surrender to? You have a shepherd that's willing to sacrifice himself for your sake. For the moments in front of you that you can trust on him, that the Lord is my shepherd. Whether it be in storms that I'm going through, whether it be in green pastures that I'm going through, whether it be in the presence of my enemies, I have a good shepherd that I can surrender to and say, I can't do this myself. I need you. In any given moment, I have my own desires. 
when I'm faced with those moments, I have my own desires. And to be honest, I'm often selfish. I, I wrestle with fear. I want what I want. Or I'm just apathetic. I don't care. I'm uncaring. I'm not empathetic. I'm distracted in those moments. I know I'm often prone not to make other people's problems my problems. And I'm often not patient and I'm often not kind. So what will I do with the moments in front of me, in front of my family, in front of our church, in front of our community? To be honest, what do I need to rescue from? I need to rescue from me. If I'm gonna be honest, where's the rescue? Where's the problem? It starts with me. When I look at the mirror, instead of all the problems, it starts here. I gotta be delivered from myself. I must surrender to a good shepherd who can save me from me. So if you're a man or a woman, young or old, and there are moments in front of you, in front of your family, in front of your church, and you're not looking over your shoulder, you're saying, it's me. Surrender yourself to a savior, to a good shepherd. I love this passage, Psalm 34. Psalm 34. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. When God showed up, they were terrified. Why? Because he is almighty God. He is right to be reverent. He is right to bow our knee to. It is right to be. <gasps> the angel of the Lord encamps around those who rightly understand who he is, and he delivers them. Who does he deliver them from? Themselves. So they taste and they see that the Lord is good. Just taste. Just taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you holy people. For those who fear him lack nothing. So in a moment, our team's gonna come out and they're gonna sing a song. And then after that, we're gonna take communion together. The song that they're gonna sing is really, it's really more like a prayer. So I'm just inviting you to just stay in your chairs. They're gonna sing this song for you. But rather than being a spectator, I want you to think about moments in front of you. Whatever circumstance you are facing or those most precious to you are facing. And I want, I want to challenge you to make this song your prayer. But it's a challenging song. Because remember I said, it's about delivering me from me. It's asking God to help you surrender areas of your life to him. It's a prayer asking you to deliver God to deliver you from you. As they sing, I challenge you to not just make it a song, but make it a prayer. And for all the moments in front of you today, taste and see that the Lord is good. Let's pray. Almighty God, your glory, your majestic power, your righteous judgment, your long-suffering, patient love, all these are combined in the reality of your son, Jesus Christ, who became sin for our sake, who, who suffered the cross that we might have a rescue for our lives. Now, Jesus, as we worship you, as we pray to you, God, I pray these are more than just words. They are the heart's desire that we would take action on today. In Jesus' name. to be accepted. 
the fear of being lonely Deliver me, oh God Deliver me, oh God And I shall not want And I shall From the fear of serving others Oh, and from the fear of death or trust